You ready? Fantastic. Okay. Uh, All right, here's Joy E. Joy E. Um, hi, um, I'm Joy E. Uh, and today I'm going to talk about JavaScript and C++ in no core and how do they talk to each other. Um, so uh, as you may have heard uh, before, Node is implemented in both C++ and JavaScript. So one of the frequently asked questions from um, new contributors and users debugging into Node core is how do they interact with each other? Uh, in, this, in this talk, I will try to answer these questions by giving a brief overview of the layers in Node, um, how the code on different layers invoke each other, and how the cross-layer memory references are managed. Um, I will show some simplified snippets from the code base along the way um, and talk about some of the ongoing work in Node Core to improve the C++ and JavaScript interactions. Uh, if you're interested in hacking on NoCore, um, for example, if you participated in the first contribution to NoCore workshop yesterday, uh, hopefully this can save you time uh, in figuring out how things work. So um, if you're already familiar with how to build C++ add-ons, uh, the C++ part of this talk probably will be fairly straightforward to you. If you are new to C++, no worries. Uh, the syntax is similar enough to JavaScript, uh, so you could just look at the method and variable names and grasp the concepts. Um, and uh, a bit of introduction of myself. Uh, I work on the Garia and Bloomberg collaboration, and uh, I have been a member of the No Technical Steering Committee as well as uh, a VA committer for a few years now. Uh, recently, I've been working on improvements to the memory infrastructure in No Core. Uh, as well as the startup snapshot integration and improvements to code caching. Uh, so now enough about me, let's move on. Um, a brief overview about the layers in Node. Most public JavaScript APIs in Node, like FSOpen, are implemented with a layer of internal JavaScript. Uh, in the source code of Node, this is mostly under the lib folder. Uh, which currently contains about 89,000 uh, lines of code. The JavaScript layer usually validates the arguments and normalizes them a bit before going to the native layer. Um, in the native or like mostly C++ layer, which is um, under the source folder, there are currently th um, 102,000 lines of code. Um, they usually convert values between JavaScript and C++ and take care of things like permission, tracing, and hooks, and uh, if necessary, they invoke the dependencies or system calls. And um, in between the two, there's the VA JavaScript virtual machine, which actually is the biggest piece um, of code in the code base. Uh, and uh, finally, there are like obviously some third-party libraries that Node depends on, like libuv, OpenSSL, and uh, Zlib. Um, yeah, and that's an overview of the layers. Um, now, let's look at some code examples. And a warning here, the internal property names shown here are just for demonstration purposes. Uh, they can be renamed in future, so please do not rely on them in the user land. Um, and some names using the examples are invented pseudonyms just to help you understand uh, how things work. Uh, now let's take uh, a simplified version of the FS OpenSync method as an example um, to see how the JavaScript layer interact with the C++ layer. Uh, as you can see here in the implementation of the FS module, uh, we usually first get a binding object here returned from a top level internal binding call. Uh, this is an um, internal version of the process binding method. The process binding me method is doc deprecated. Please don't use it in the user land. Uh, this is like internal only now, okay? Um, and um, this object is used to organize uh, the functionalities that the CPAP layer exposes to the JavaScript layer. 
And uh, this is how they are organized conceptually. Uh, so in each node instance, for example, the one on the main thread, there is one uh, structure called environment. And in each environment, there is at least one JavaScript round. Uh, for now, there is usually just the principal round. But when the uh, TC39 shadow round proposal goes through, uh, there will be multiple rounds, uh, each one of them for each um, shadow round. Um, now, each round here also contains a list of bindings. Uh, these are organized as keyed objects. So for example, there's one for FS, uh, and there's also one for timers, uh, and so on. Uh, and the JavaScript land can retrie uh, retrieve these objects using the internal binding call. Uh, and in that particular FS binding, there are yet a bunch of keyed properties. For example, the native open function that can be invoked from the JavaScript land that we saw before. Um, now, uh, normally when we create the binding objects, which uh, what typically happens is that we create the object template for the binding object, um, which references many other function templates. And when we instantiate an actual object for this temp uh, from this template, when internal binding is called, uh, uh, and uh, with any of the functions of these binding objects, for example, open, gets called in the JavaScript land. VA looks up the C++ function following the pointers here. Uh, it sets up some internal states, for example, putting the arguments together into a C++ structure, and then it will just invoke the C++ function. So uh, let's get back to the example. Um, so in OpenSync, we first do a bit of validation of the arguments. We uh, no normalize them, for example, turning strings into numbers and assigning default values. And then we get the open function from the binding object and we invoke it. Uh, and we go into the C++ land, uh, which is a VA binding called open. And yes, no still use uh, raw VA stuff internally today instead of using anything fancy like the node API uh, thing that uh, Michael mentioned before. Um, and the C++ layer then converts the JavaScript arguments into C++ values uh, and then open the file with the libuv uvfs open method. Uh, this is the synchronous variant. Uh, and then libuv invoke appropriate system calls for the platform and then return the result back to the C++ layer synchronously because this is the synchronous variant. Um, and then the binding um, converts the result into a JavaScript integer if it's successful um, and then return it to the JavaScript land. So uh, that is basically how synchronous bindings in Node uh, are implemented so far. Uh, but is there a better way to do this? Is there a way to make them faster? Uh, well, the answer is yes. Um, so there is a new VA feature called fast API calls that can help us speed up the invocation from JavaScript to C++. So um, take this method, for example, which Node internally uses to guess the type of a file descriptor and then return a uh, constant that the JavaScript land understands uh, as the type of the file descriptor. Um, now, to add support for fast API calls, we add another implementation here called fast guess handle type. So in the fast version, there's no need to worry about the arguments uh, or like uh, converting the return values. VA will do that for us. Uh, now, similar to the FS open function we looked at before, um, this function is stored in a binding called util, and in function templates of that, uh, we give VA two native functions, uh, the original one and the fast one. When this function is run many, many times in the JavaScript land, and the argument and the return type is always matching the fast version that we have here, um, the next time VA calls the function, instead of calling the original version of the binding, VA would inline the conversions for us and call the fast version. Uh, now, there are some rules about the fast API implementation. We cannot allocate JavaScript objects here. Uh, we cannot call back to JavaScript. 
and uh, we cannot throw exceptions, so many restrictions. Um, in return, the overhead of calling from JavaScript to C++ is smaller because we no longer need to set things up uh, for those stuff. So it's about 10% faster for most bindings in Node. Uh, in some features, the call from JavaScript to C++ can be quite frequent, so they add up. Um, and we're now adding support for fast API calls in more bindings internally in Node, um, as long as they can work with the limitations mentioned before. Um, so that was uh, the synchronous APIs, um, which normally involves just calls from JavaScript to C++. Um, now let's look at how asynchronous API works, and this usually involves calling back to JavaScript from C++. Uh, here we have the FS open method, um, which is asynchronous. Uh, the routines are really, very similar to that of the synchronous version, just that in the JavaScript land, Node creates an additional object to hold on to the user provided callback. Um, and uh, in the C++ land, instead of invoking the synchronous version of the library method, we invoke the asynchronous one uh, and pose a task into the library event loop uh, with a callback. And when library invokes the native callback, we unwrap a bit uh, to get back the JavaScript request object and we read on complete callback that we assigned before in the JavaScript land. Um, and we, then uh, it converts the results back to JavaScript values and call back to uh, JavaScript from C++. Well, uh, that seems simple enough, uh, except that this also, again, skips over an important detail. Uh, actually, instead of calling to JavaScript directly, uh, Node has an internal utility uh, if you have been building add-ons with asynchronous API before, you might be uh, familiar with this. This is called make callback, and this wraps around a bunch of complexities for the actual routine uh, in Node to call back into JavaScript. Uh, what, is, what does it do? Um, besides just invoking the JavaScript function, it also runs micro tasks uh, coming from the premises, if there are any, uh, which is pretty common. And then it runs the callbacks killed by process next stick, which is also fairly common. And if there are any async hooks configured, uh, this needs to be emitted to the JavaScript land too. So theoretically, there would not be any overhead if there are no micro tasks, no takes, no hooks to run. Uh, but in practice, many of these get in the way in real world applications. Uh, as a result, uh, make callback tend to be much, much slower than simply calling back to JavaScript in V8, uh, even though we have done some optimizations with it. But um, changing the actual behavior of this can break the ordering in which things get called. Um, and order is sometimes assumed by users. Um, so how the overhead can be reduced without hurting compatibility is still under investigation. Um, so now we've talked about code inter, uh, invocations. Uh, let's take a look at the memory. Uh, in Node, most JavaScript and C++ memory interfacing is done through wrappers that inherit from the base object class. Um, then we have many different subclasses of base object with different kinds of life cycles. For example, one of the most important class is handle wrap. Uh, whose JavaScript wrappers are held live by C++ objects. And then uh, the C++ objects are reference counted, usually to release the resources. Um, some, uh, LibUV, in some LibUV callback, LibUV notifies nudges that, um, for example, via UV close, uh, that this, some, resources, some resource is no longer needed, uh, and then node decrease the reference count of the C++ object. And uh, when the reference count of the C++ thing is zero, node then notifies VA to release the JavaScript wrapper. Uh, the wrapper for TCP connections, TCP red, which we are going to look into later, it belongs to this class. 
And there's also another class of objects like uh, file handle, whose memory management depends on the VA garbage collector. Usually when the JavaScript wrapper is no longer reachable from, from the JavaScript land, VA notifies Node uh, about this, and Node deletes that C++ object. And finally, there are some special ones like binding data that holds on uh, to all the JavaScript binding methods that we talked about earlier. Like that's the wrapper for whatever that gets returned um, from internal binding. This is usually gone, like only gone when the round is going away. For example, in the principal round of the main instance, that goes away when the node instance is, is actually shutting down. Okay, so uh, now let's take a closer look at an example, the TCP wrap. Uh, here are some, again, some code snippets simplified from the net socket class. Uh, this was created before ES6 classes became a thing, and for compatibility reasons, that's still not a ES6 class. That's why you're seeing all these prototype methods here. Um, so when the socket starts a TCP connection via the connect method, the uh, TCP new binding is invoked to create a C++ TCP wrap object. It wraps around the uh, this JavaScript object being constructed by VA, and then VA returns this object to JavaScript land. Uh, and in the JavaScript land, the socket puts it behind a symbol property called well handle. Uh, the C++ object here actually holds another strong reference to the JavaScript land TCP object, and that's what really keeps the TCP object alive. If for some reason the socket goes away by itself, uh, the TCP handle would be uh, would be still be kept alive by the TCP uh, by the C++ TCP wrap as long as that one is still alive. But that don't usually happen if you just use the API normally. Um, then at some point in time, after the caller is done using this socket, for example, when the connection ends, typically the destroy method should be called on the socket object, which in turn invokes a close method uh, that the TCP wrap inherits from handle wrap. Um, and then the close method invokes UV close to close the uh, to close it asynchronously and uh, store the JavaScript land callback in TCP handle as a symbol property for uh, invocation later. And then finally, when the viewer finishes closing everything, uh, the unclose native callback is invoked, um, and that detach the TCP wrap from the C++ heap. So when the reference count of that reaches zero in C++, the TCP wrap would be destroyed um, and when the, uh, when the C++ object is gone, the strong reference to the JavaScript land thing is uh, also gone, uh, so that only references from the JavaScript land will keep the handle alive. Uh, now, one last thing before we are done with the TCP wrap, we invoke the onclose JavaScript method, uh, the JavaScript callback using make callback, and in this case, uh, in the specific implementation of the socket, the close event will be emitted, uh, and another bunch of cleanup will be done. And um, after close, uh, everything will be gone when the socket and the TCP handle becomes unreachable, uh, unreachable from JavaScript. Uh, and here is what the corresponding heap snapshot will look like. Um, so one quick note, when you see uh, nodes prefixed with the node uh, uh, slash prefix, these correspond to C++ objects uh, from node. And uh, this is the rele relevant path of our previous example. The socket object uh, references a TCP handle via a symbol called K handle. And then the TCP handle has a JavaScript to native reference to a node TCP wrap object, uh, which it re references back via another native to JavaScript edge. 
Uh, and the memory layout roughly looks like this. The public socket object um, has a simple property storing the JavaScript TCP wrapper. Uh, and its wrapper uh, is the JavaScript part of the TCP wrap class. It has an array of embedded data which contains a slot that's actually an pointer to the C++ TCP object. Uh, the socket, the wrapper, and the embedded data array, they all live in the VA heap, whereas the TCP wrap class live in the node heap. Um, in a heap snapshot containing a socket, you can see the references being marked as uh, JavaScript to native and native to JavaScript here. This is a cycle, um, and that's why the DevTools, DevTools shows um, the native to JavaScript edge as gray. Uh, that's what it does for cycles. And uh, when the TCP wrap is detached, the TCP wrapper uh, becomes fully managed by the VA heap. And when there are JavaScript references, uh, when the JavaScript references to it uh, are gone, uh, it will also be available uh, to be garbage collected. So as we mentioned before, some objects in Node are kept alive by the JavaScript land instead. So for example, um, file handle, which is wrapped around by uh, the objects returned by FS promise open. This references the JavaScript wrapper using a weak handle. So the C++ object does not actually hold the uh, JavaScript object alive. It's the other way around. Uh, and here is a small snippet taken from the code base in the weak callback that uh, node pass to V8, which is supposed to be called when a uh, JavaScript object goes away, we delete the C++ object. Um, the C++ object, um, so, and in the heap snapshots, the uh, C++ objects are held alive only by JavaScript objects and have no other references from C++. So these are uh, prefixed with detached in the heap snapshots. So if you see them, that's uh, what it means. Uh, and in the current setup, um, things work most of the time, but it's still a bit tricky. Uh, many base objects have additional JavaScript references. Some of them are not, uh, some of them are also managed using the weak callback, which is actually a hack. As the VA header shown here, uh, the comments says that V does not actually guarantee when or if the callback is called. Um, so far, the weak callback is usually called in time, and we don't usually rely on uh, the callback for actual critical resource management. Uh, instead, we rely on something like the closed method that you've seen before. Uh, but still, this is not quite following what the documentation suggests, and wrappers can still be leaked <coughs> if they're managed using this callback. Uh, and the incorrect usage of the weak references gave us the bugs like this, which is why, uh, for example, a lot of Jest users are still stuck at node 16. So in case you're also stuck because, because of these, the bugs are fixed in 21 now. So uh, please try 21 and see if they go away for you. And these fixes will be backported to older LTS releases soon. Um, now, instead of chasing all these incorrectly, sorry, incorrectly configured callback down to fix all these bugs. Uh, we have a different plan here uh, to deal with these issues. We have a, a plan to improve the cross-layer memory management using the OilPan library from V8. Uh, this is a library developed in Blink, uh, the rendering engine of the Chromium browser, um, deal with uh, sim similar issues. Uh, later, this library got carved out of Blink and moved into VA for other embedders like Node to use. So uh, it's a trace-based C++ garbage collector uh, that allows embedders to allocate their C++ objects in a heap that's, uh, that can be uh, visible to V8. And with that, it's easier to avoid memory issues caused by cross-layer memory, memory management, um, like the bugs that we've seen before. Um, and this also allows us to migrate away from the hack, uh, the set weak, uh, weak callback hack that I've seen before that was advised against in the VA header. 
Uh, this is recently bootstrapped in Node, and we are experimenting with some uh, internal objects to migrate away uh, from the existing model and to this new model. Um, so that's all. Thanks for listening to me. Okay, I think we yeah we definitely have a time for a few questions. If anybody has some. Okay. Okay. Uh, it's great to hear about this oil pen CPP GC migration. Uh, I heard that you're helping to implement that. What would what would help you make progress there from the rest of the Node.js community? Uh. I think so far uh, the plan is to start from one of those more trivial objects, uh, just in case, because we also have this ref counting mechanism that you kind of like, during the migration, you need to make the two work together in, before we've done all that. Uh, so uh, there might be some kind of like crash that happened. So uh, if you are on you know, older versions of uh, if you're on like older version of Node, you can like try them out on the newer versions of Node and see if it crashes you, <laughs> I guess. Uh, and we'll provide try to provide some kind of mechanism for you to like fall back to the old memory management scheme. But uh, we don't expect this to be like you know just uh, painless migration. <laughs> there might be some bugs, and it will be helpful to get some feedback and you know try to make things um, managed better along the way. Joy, amazing talk. Um, Joy for president of Node. Um, and so I, I have a couple quick questions. One is, um, like, out of all the Node APIs, uh, I'm curious which of the APIs you think is, like, kind of prime for more performance improvements, like the one that you just highlighted? Um, like, what, and second question is, like, is there a way to leverage Wasm to kind of make things go faster? Because I keep hearing about all these crazy hacks where people just, like, wrap something in Wasm and somehow it's just, like, faster. So I'm just curious if you have thoughts on that. Uh, so in terms of what can be made faster, um, one thing that I've recently, uh, you know, uh, noticed uh, but uh, uh, haven't done anything about it, someone else is doing something about it, uh, is not technically an API is the ESM loader uh, because we're uh, uh, no core is you know trying to make the ESM loader more of a thing make ESM like uh, more supported uh, to the user end uh, and the ESM loader is um, not quite fast uh, and there are a lot of things that can be improved um, for example moving more things to the uh, CPAP land um, and uh, yeah, I think that's one thing that's like pretty important for most users of Node, and uh, it can use a lot of like optimizations and improvements there. Uh, and the second question uh, is about uh, using Wasm internally in Node. Uh, we do have like usage of Wasm in case you didn't notice. Uh, for example, we have something that detects uh, the named import exports in the uh, ESM modules. Uh, and that thing is implemented in Wasm, or well, implementing C, and then compiled Wasm, and Node run it as a Wasm module. Um, uh, but uh, I think that's a pretty specific case where, like, you have this uh, pretty good library that you can use, and you don't want to like create a bunch of glue to do that to import that in Node. So you just commit it to Wasm. Uh, most of the time, it's still faster to just go bearable. I think that's also one of the reasons why we are not even using Node API or anything in the core. We just use the raw VA stuff. Uh, sometimes because uh, the, um, as you've seen in Michael's talk before, the Node uh, API does not target all use cases. Uh, they target like 80% of the use cases. Um, so and Node kind of like falls, the like Node core kind of falls into like a category where like it just needs a bunch of stuff that only VA has uh, for optimizations, for whatever. Um, so uh, even to this day, Node is still using raw VA APIs for various reasons. I, uh, I think it kind of also applies to Wasm somehow. A lot of times, it just use, just do things simply and uh, use very bare stuff. But um, 
uh, there are definitely cases where WASM can be leveraged. Uh, for example, the um, HTTP uh, parser that Pablo shared yesterday uh, implemented in Rust. There are some discussions about you know, importing that as a WASM thing uh, to deal with some of the build, thing, build issues that we have. Uh, so sure, they, uh, there are some plans but, uh, to, to leverage your WASM in Node, but probably not as optimization, but more like to get around with certain build constraints. Hi, um, great talk. Um, and I've seen a few talks and workshops about seeing like behind the curtain of Node, the C++, and it's, it's great to see. But I'm just wondering about um, how there's like a push from like the NSA in America and um, OpenSSF's 10-point mobility plan to push organizations away from memory on safe languages like C and C++. And I'm just wondering if there is a, a sort of, and I've seen a few talks about using Rust in no core, and is there a movement to, to, to use Rust or other uh, memory safe languages in core itself? <coughs> Sorry. Uh, so, for example, Milo, the Rust HTTP parser is like one of them, but I think so far it's kind of difficult to migrate Node away from C. Uh, one of the main reasons is that VA is implemented in C. So, Sometimes it's just easier uh, if you want to be lazy. Uh, it's just easier uh, to interface with VA in C++. Uh, even though, for example, there are also obviously runtimes out there like Deno that interface uh, VA with Rust. They have some kind of like um, binding wrapper uh, for for VA VA APIs. Um, but I think uh, for Node, so far it's probably difficult to like yank the whole thing out and uh, replace things with Rust. Uh, there are definitely like components that are more self-contained that you can implement in Rust and somehow make that interface with other parts of the code base. Uh, and I think that's possible. Um, but um, in terms of the entire code base, I think as far as I can see, it's probably going to stay in Rust for most of the time. Uh, but for some components, definitely that's possible. Okay. Um. Well, um, thank you, Joyee. That was a fantastic talk. I love seeing the C++ stuff.